Next, we we would have the creator of Ground Truth, but unfortunately, the unavoidable COVID caught Peter. So instead, we have the wonderful JP Pratt presenting on his behalf. Thank you, JP. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Izzy. Um, uh, kia ora. Um, yes, um, Izzy's um, introduced me as a stand-in for Peter, a, uh, a poor stand-in, but um, a stand-in nevertheless. So I will um, endeavour to do justice to... Uh, the work that Peter's put into this um, presentation and indeed his work over the last uh, 20 plus years in the space of, um, of developing practical uh, pathways to the future. Um, Peter and I met at university 35 years ago, um, sharing an office. I was doing my uh, PhD on uh, no tillage crop establishment and um, Peter was working with, um, with Ralph Sims on biomass uh, for bioenergy. So um, he got me interested in forestry, so I promptly went out and planted some, uh, some pine trees and some other trees at that point, and he took about 30 years to catch up to me. So um, I got the jump on him in terms of planting trees, but um, we just want to, um, he was keen that we, we sort of um, start with the so practical pathways to the future. We need to start with a vision, and the vision is that is that native forest forms a, a key or a core to the framework that supports uh, productive and sustainable uh, land use. And so we've already heard this, um, Paul uh, Quinlan stole quite a lot of my, or my Peter's thunder, in terms of um, you know, this, this premise that, that native forest actually um, underpins everything we do. It's not just something else, it's not in a, it's not in a, a separate category, it's, it's part of what we do. And so um, we think it's really important that it's a core of the framework to, un, to, um, to support um, other land use. And of course we all know about you know, the benefits of, 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 um, of native forest, but how do you get it to work at a, at a business level and in a, and in a farm um, uh, landscape? So um, previous speakers mentioned about silos and, um, and so Peter and I, I'm an agriculturalist um, by, by trade, if you like, did a PhD in agricultural or agronomic engineering, and, uh, and Peter's a forestry um, consultant, sort of classically trained. So we got together, um, we always sort of maintain uh, contact and got together to try and break down the silos of forestry and agriculture to, uh, to bring them together, and it's sort of uh, working out now in terms of um, you know what we're looking at in terms of our, our future. So um, so what is it? What, what what could it look like? So we've got um, we've got our native forest protecting our, our waterways. So as Paul was saying, native forests up all the gullies to protect the uh, to protect the water. Um, but we're maintaining our um, our productive and uh, and our flagship, if you like, our productive land in New Zealand as as sustainable uh, businesses. Now to do this in terms of achieving this and um, other things like um, cultural uses and outputs um, along the way, good planning is, is really required and that's where we've put a lot of effort in sustainable land management planning starting with, um, starting with uh, land use capability and existing vegetation. So an example there of some existing vegetation that needs to be uh, supported, that's the place to start if you want to start improving biodiversity. Um, so I'm not, telling you guys anything you don't know, which is a bit of a, um, um, you know, um, I guess a difference for me. I'm usually talking about something new, GPS or something. Well, that was 30 years ago. Um, but the key, the key thing to, to get these wide and integrated uses is to get the community involved, the um, mana whenua and community at that level um, actually doing the work um, on the ground. And this is a, uh, an example of uh, measuring uh, tuna or eels in a um, cultural harvest situation, um, a project we're working on in, in Waikanae. So some experience it is sort of alluded to, um, uh, over 20 years um, experience in this space, but Ground Truth is a business, so um, Peter and I and, uh, and, and Dan Barr even are directors of, of Ground Truth, and, and uh, Dan is actually a, um, a hardware software guy, so he's an IT guy. So, We've brought together quite a lot of disciplines in, within Ground Truth and around ecology, agriculture, conservation, and technology 
to, to address this, um, this issue of how do we get more native forest um, in, into, our, um, into our businesses in New Zealand. So we've got quite a lot of experience, so we'll just take you through a few of those um, practical sort of things that we've done along the way. Um, so for the, for the pathways to be practical, they need to be economically sustainable, and you just can't get away from that. So how do you integrate them with the economic, uh, with the economic use of the land and maintain a, a viable business? Um, that's got to be, uh, the, the land use change has got to be feasible, uh, has a feasible cost, and, and we all know, you know, the lowest cost denominator is, is pine trees in terms of carbon, we know where that's going, or has gone. But you also need to be, think about future income, it's for it to be viable in the future, um, not just today. So we do need to have a longer term view. It needs to be ecologically appropriate. Um, Paul talked about, you know, where uh, Tortora might have a role to play in New Zealand. Um, certainly in Taumaranui, which we've done some work with the Marion Corporation, it's almost classed as a weed there, and we need to adopt some of those um, management practices that Paul's um, pioneered. So thanks for that, Paul. Um, and to, in terms of a multi-dimensional uh, business, and it's got to be technically achievable. And we've already heard, West, uh, you know, weeds and pests are the, are the some of the snakes um, that um, that lurk in the undergrowth. So economic sustainability. Um, so benefits from native forests. So the key. Um, I better stick to my script that Peter carefully produ produced for me. Um, the native forest can improve the resilience and the profitability of other land uses, um, so underpinning, and by protecting uh, production areas from erosion and flooding, providing shelter and shade uh, for livestock and for the people on the land, and reducing costs of recovery from storm events, which you all know uh, increasing frequency and severity is uh, heading our way. Um, and it also, of course, improves uh, the appeal and the real estate value of, of the properties. So um, this is an example from a narrow station up on the east coast where we've first, first deal off, or first cab off the rank is to do a farm scale land use capability map, um, where are our best production areas, and then um, map around that. So how do we protect that and enhance that, and how, how can also we enhance the production of, of, the, um, of the, the lower class land as well. And then we've got our, um, our uh, or biodiversity or vegetation that we've mapped as well. And, and then we produce a, a, a sort of a management zones. And so identifies that high value land and, ha and, and starts working on actions to uh, protect that. But sort of in, in terms of um, an example, so here we've got um, some sheep and beef country that, that's probably uh, earning you know, $600 per hectare um, in terms of uh, profit, a net profit. This, this area here is probably more like $60 a hectare. So, um, you know, this is, where, um, this is where other uses for the land um, need to be looked at, not, not here. Um, it's similar for production forestry. You'll see, um, you know, these areas here, broad ridges, uh, harvest costs around $35 a tonne. But you get onto these steep slopes and you're talking about $60 per tonne. So you've got reduced um, profitability. Um, it's sort of like the application of precision agriculture at a landscape uh, level. Better granularity around understanding the profitability of your land and you can make better choices uh, going forward. So what about those choices? So we've done some modelling with, um, with Ag First, been privileged to work with them. And um, this modelling's been based on $85 a tonne for carbon and a 5% discount rate. So um, for, for sheep and beef farms, um, their, their sort of EBITDA or earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortisation is around $200 to $500 per hectare. Um, for forestry annuities, we're looking at, whoops, at um, you know, $900 to $1,000 for pine, $400 for special purpose species, things like cypress, um, but for native, it's a negative um, 250. So that's the that's the um, the the, the uh, problem, if you like, in terms of um, encouraging landowners to to plant native, is that it's a negative uh, return, and that's no good on anybody's balance sheet. But if you um, change, you know, between 10 and 30 percent of uh, insensible land use change on hill country sheep and beef, you can improve um, significant increase in, in EBITDA with um, change to radiata. You can actually increase it with special purpose species, things like cypress and, and redwoods, but you get a significant decrease with, with native. So, so really, we need to have an integrated approach where there's some pine, there's some special purpose species, and some native. 
And that's really important because Rod Carr talked yesterday about um, 2050 being carbon neutral ongoing. It's not just reaching the target of carbon neutral at 2050, it's how it's got to be sustainable. And the way we make it sustainable is by making sure there's native in that mix because that has a long a longevity you know, around carbon um, sequestration as opposed to some of these other crops which are in the meantime giving us an income so we can put bread on the table. So um, in terms of uh, native, it needs to be, as we said, ecologically appropriate, technically feasible. Um, we need to look at what historically um, forests were there, what, what do you have and what's its condition, and it's a function of, of a matrix. We've already heard, heard about rainfall temperature, um, but proximity to native forests um, is, are really, is really important, and the threats, animals, weeds, and fire, as we've already heard, um, will, will also have an influence. Um, but access and use is really important, and so, you know, how, how are you going to actually do it? How are you going to achieve it? Um, is really, and, and, how, and then what are you going to use that for ongoing? So if you've got good access, you can introduce a recreational, recreational use, that sort of thing. But also, um, you know, it, it determines how, whether or not you can do some mechanical intervention and, and keep the cost down. Oops. So some examples. So we've got there on the, uh, the top right, uh, 1,500 mils of rainfall. Um, this is a, a slide from 40 years ago, photo from uh, just at the back uh, behind Mike and I. And we've got a seed source close by. Um, and in 40 years, we've got a, um, quite a well-developed secondary uh, native forest there um, through natural regeneration. But you can see there's already some creeping in. And so um, that, you know, that can happen naturally in a high rainfall site with a seed source. So on, on the other hand, if you've got a lower rainfall, this is around 1,000 mils per, per year of rainfall. Um, that's been, um, you know, stock have been removed for that from 30 years. There's a bit of blackberry growing there, but not much else. So this is where you might need to do some planting or, in fact, some direct seeding, um, you know, which we've done a little bit of work on as well. Um, so the interventions uh, will be required. Natural regeneration is just n not going to happen, as we've heard from the previous speaker. Um, so where can it happen? So again, it depends on that um, seed source, rainfall, and management. So these are um, open canopies with uh, under, under uh, an understory of native coming through. Um, they tend to be close to seed source and, and have good rainfall. Uh, Adam Forbes is going to speak much more, uh, way more eloquently than me about transition later. So um, this is something that we've got some operational research going on in the, uh, behind Wike and I. And that's um, uh, where we've uh, clear felled some 30-year-old uh, pine trees, and um, and native is coming through uh, quite happily. Um, these ones here were were not felled. Um, there's native coming up through there simply because of light getting to the base, um, and they were kept for sh for shelter of these um, flat areas up the top. A great example that um, Pete sort of been worked worked on uh, for quite a number of years since you know, since early 2000s is the Arapuki. Uh, forest, which is behind Palmerston North, um, behind Palmerston North and the Tararuas. And so in that case, there's 140 hectares of, of exotic, i.e. Um, Pinus radiata forest that, was, uh, that has been progressively felled, and, um, and they've come up with a plan to, to do a diverse um, forest as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the next stage or the next iteration of forest. So that's where um, that site, uh, looking from the, from the bottom up, now from the top down, so you can see after five years is, is quite a good uh, understory of native forest developing. Um, there was two sweeps, if you like, through there to, um, to take out the regen um, pinus radiata. So, you know, even with regen and, and walking away, there's still a cost got to be are involved, and that's something that's got to be remembered. You just can't shut the gate and walk away. So there's quite an elaborate plan. Um, uh, that, that has been put in place here. And so we've got our um, special purpose and other species um, being um, on, the, on the broader ridges, on the flatter areas, that uh, can we be harvested um, selectively or, you know, or clear felled. Um, but there's now 70 hectares of, whoops, of native, um, native sort of protection areas. And there's a, there's a, a pristine waterway along here and a snail, uh, native snail reserve on the top side. So, so the native has been, um, uh, if you like, retained and, and um, improved or enhanced 
uh, for the protection of the surrounding area. And the, the thing about, um, I guess, the way they've approached this is there's been no aerial spray, so, so the native undergrowth, there's a huge amount of native undergrowth in, within these um, alternative special purpose species. But our special purpose species can provide us with, um, with timber to use for cabinetry, the sort of things Paul was talking about, buildings, commercial buildings, and integrating into our, you know, into our everyday life, timber needs to be that where timber needs to go if we're going to get rid of fossil fuels. So within 30 years, you can be harvesting um, usable timber. So, um, so it's and it comes back to those economics, so, which are really important for um, for landowners to to um, to appreciate or to you know, you've got to appreciate people have got to make a living. Um, yeah. So uh, someone mentioned about um, uh, loss of underpants or something or other. Um, this is a, a forest that's lost its underpants. And, and this is through browsing animals. So this is behind Waikanae as well. Um, and here's a uh, forest um, in a similar location um, that uh, where all the browsing animals have been excluded for a number of years. And so you've got increase in biomass, increase in biodiversity, um, you know, um, the, the sort of the, the key things that we're all looking for uh, down the track. So the, the message really is we need to be protecting this before we worry about um, planting some of that other land which might have better uses alternatively. So um, at Ground Truth we've been working on um, sort of operational research around how do we make native um, restoration uh, more cost effective and, um, and so we've, got, we've got, got the system we're calling Native Forest Systems which is um, which is an end-to-end -end, uh, service, if you like, for, for, for um, native forest establishment. And so we've, we've managed to get the, the, um, the efficiency up to a, sort of a more forestry sort of a type standard, i.e. someone can plant a thousand trees a day. And in four years, we've got, um, you know, we've got um, free-to-grow forest that's um, ready to, to take on all the, um, all the, the uh, browsers and, and weeds um, that might come along. So we, we have this end-to-end -end thing, so eco, we eco-source the seed, establish it in a nursery and, and plant it out. Um, and we've got it down to a cost in the order that, um, I think it was Adam or Andrew Thompson yesterday, Andrew, Adam Thompson was talking about, um, you know, sort of between eleven and $18,000 per hectare. So it becomes more manageable, but it's really important this end-to-end -end management, and that's part of the secret, if you like. So when I was working with um, direct drilling at Massey, um, all those years ago, we, there was a direct drill that was built and, and put out there in terms of an extension service, and the farmers had to organise the seed, the, you know, the fertiliser, the pest control, weed control, and it was a disaster because they didn't know how to use this new, new tool. And so um, it wasn't until we actually um, provided the whole package, i.e. went out there, visited, planned the site, got the, got the pest control sorted, the weed control, and then seed selection and site selection and actually did the drilling on the right day rather than whenever we could, that it actually worked. So, so that end-to-end -end thing is, is really important when you're talking about um, our new systems moving forward. Um, so it, it is really, in sort of in summary, um, it's really important to, to get um, the community involved, especially um, the iwi, mana whenua, to get this integrated land use approach so we can get an, a range, quite a range of outcomes. But the drivers that we have, we've all heard about um, carbon for climate, climate change purposes, water quality and biodiversity um, are other um, environmental drivers. We've currently only really got one economic one and that's carbon and that's really booted things under the backside um, you know, already. And so, uh, so maybe some more, um, some more support around water quality and biodiversity protection um, can give it another lift. So we've got the tools for major expansion. You know, we've, we've worked from um, tens of hectares in a project right through, we can, we're now sort of capable of doing hundreds of hectares um, for native forest um, systems establishment, um, but we need to be um, partnering, partnering with um, uh, in longer term um, relationships to get that to work economically for everyone. So I just want to um, uh, finish with the, that leadership and collaboration is required to achieve our vision uh, for integrated sustainable landscape with nature forest at its, at its core. And so that's leadership 
um, from above, from the top. Paul's already alluded to um, Morgan Williams, you know, conclusion, if you like, that the market is king. And so, um, you know, so that's where, that's where we need to start, right at the top, in terms of um, driving some of this change. <laughs>